good afternoon everyone welcome to the veterinary talks i am dr abhishek ms i would like to thank all of you for joining us on behalf of advanced surgical skill enhancement division anapoya deemed to be university uh, today is the second webinar that we are having uh, under the name veterinary talks we all know that veterinary talks the main objective of our veterinary talks is dissemination of a knowledge acquiring of a knowledge and also learning the clinical skills from the expert veterinarians throughout the world in this uh, today's webinar we had our uh, chief guest as uh, honorable vice chancellor dr m vijay kumar uh, because of his busy schedule he is unable to join uh, i would also thank our uh, honorable vice chancellor for giving us an opportunity to conduct the webinar and also a platform to conduct the webinar for our veterinary fraternity in the uh, medical university like enapoya and uh, before we get started i would like to inform you all that the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available for the future reference this recording will be available in the enapoya youtube channel uh, then we can use it for for the reference everyone who is in the audience i kindly request all to mute your audio and video both for the effective learning experience and uh, by doing so you can also avoid unnecessarily being seen or being heard however if you like to submit a question to the speaker while presentation we encourage you to do so by typing your question in the chat window this will be monitored by myself and i will going to ask the speaker to answer as many questions as possible within the stipulated time that we have here today okay with this brief introduction we will get into the our uh, actual today's webinar today we have our uh, speaker dr omar joskun from sweden uh, dr omar is an uh, certified canine rehabilitation therapist he has uh, he is presently working as an resident surgeon in the european college of veterinary surgeon uh, uh, that is in the sweden then dr omar uh, area of interest were uh, rehabilitation canine sports medicine uh, canine sports injuries traumatology uh, rheumatology then uh, uh, orthopedics most of the in indian situation we mainly in the clinical practice we used to do the orthopedics and all other operations but mainly what we miss is the rehabilitation as like the post operative care is needed the rehabilitation is also one of the main important aspect that we shouldn't have to miss in our clinical practice but today uh, in our uh, as per my knowledge most of the time we usually miss the rehabilitation hence the to today's webinar topic related to the cranial cruciate ligament dr omar is going to discuss about a topic that uh, current techniques in uh, cranial cruciate ligament disease in canine cru cruciate ligament disease diagnosis treatment and also rehabilitation this will be very helpful for all of us for not even learning about the cruciate disease also learning about for the about the rehabilitation of the animals what is its necessity and what is its main usefulness for the can our canine patients with this brief introduction i would like to hand over the screen to dr omar kindly please all audience mute your audio and video and enjoy the learning happy learning so the screen is yours sir thank you so much dr abhishek i would like to thank you the napoya university to give me the opportunity meet all of you in those difficult days uh, according to the pandemic now it's difficult it's almost impossible to meet other colleagues and the lecturers the in the face to face congresses but with the the internet webinar meetings uh, thanks god we can keep continue that and hopefully in the soon future we will handle to make the face to face meeting and hopefully on that time we can meet face to face with you so today's meeting i will i will try to explain uh, cruciate ligament disease the current diagnostics and some of the developed techniques but not that clinically used 
uh, that much. But then, then I will try to talk you some three osteotomy techniques that we often use to practice in our uh, the clinics. And then, most important, the hidden uh, treatment technique is the, or not hidden, but uh, forget the, the technique is the rehabilitation. So I will start now, if you can. Yes, can you see my presentation right now? Yes, sir. yes, sir. we can. Yes. Yes, cranial cushion problem is the one of the most reason of the high limb lameness. So the, the, as we said, the cranial cushion ligament as an orthopedician, we see in daily basis. As a normal uh, first practice clinician, you see almost every week. And if you're aware of that problem, so easy to diagnose. But if you not that uh, common or uh, not that used to with orthopedic patients, so easily to miss. In uh, 2003, in, they spent almost $1.3 billion just for the cushion ligament treatment in the USA. If you think of the population, those population uh, rises, of course, the, those, the, the, the spend of the money, they also, it rises that much. Before we come to the cushion disease diagnose and things, we have to know the anatomy of the stifle joint. When we look at the stifle joint, we have to know we have two collateral and the collateral medial and lateral uh, the ligaments. And we have the patella and the patella tendon attached to the, uh, towards the tibia. And then we have inside the joint cushion ligament. And cushion ligament, we have two different parts, caudal and cranial part. And also we have very important structures it's called menisci, the lateral and the, the medial, as we can see in here. So uh, the origin of the, the cranial cushion ligament is a lateral, the the femoral condyle to the caudomedial, uh, the insertion is the tibial cranial intercondyloid. And the parts are there, there's two different parts in the cranial cushion ligament, cranial medial band and the caudolateral band. Caudolateral band is the, the little bit bigger portion. In the future of the, in the later in the presentation, we will uh, watch some arthroscopic wheels, then I can explain you a little bit more in that. When we think the, the stifle joint, if we compare with the human, because uh, as you know, in the human field, cruciate ligament problem is also is a big problem in the human orthopedics. But the difference is it between human and the canines, or felines of course, human tibial plateau is almost two to four degrees. So almost the parallel to the ground. But if we, like, if we think our patients, more than 20 degrees. And the average, according to some studies, 25 till 28. But then sometimes in the clinics, we see over 30 degrees. And that's why it gives a lot of strength to the cruciate ligament to be able to stabilize the, the stifle. As we see how we measure the, the tibial plateau angle, which is very important in the, in the later of the presentation, I will explain why it's important to, because we have to measure the tibial plateau angle and then we will rotate the tibial plateau to be able to gain uh, the, the specific angle to be able to neutralize the instability in the stifle joint. When we come to the pathogenesis, uh, the 
percent of the cases are the traumatic. And of course, when this traumatic cases, not always only the craniocuchal ligament injured. It is sometimes caudal, sometimes collateral ligaments, sometimes the patellar tendon uh, injuries can occur as well. And we have to think is the cranial tibial truss mechanism is according to the jumping or heavy landings, when the magnetic thrust is higher than the ligament strength, then the ligament cannot hold it anymore, and then it's uh, made a rupture. And most of the time we see a total rupture, as also we can see in excessive internal rotation. For example, a hunting dog running after the pride and stack on a hind lip, but the, the body keep turning on the side and the big moments and then the, with the rotation and uh, we have rupture in the craniocuchal ligament. And also hyperextension, and those we mostly see the the playing dogs. They're just running around in the dog yard, and they don't have that much control with the other dogs, and they can easily hit on the stifle. And then we have a hyperextension, and that's where cranial cruciate ligament try to stop the hyperextension. But if the uh, the trauma impact higher than the strength of the ligament, then we see uh, total rupture. But as, as I said, this was uh, only the 30 and 20% of the, the causes of the crochet ligament problem. The mostly we see degeneration. And still we don't know exactly why, but we know excessive tibial plateau angle has a big role into the, the, the disease. And of course, age-related ligament degeneration, and Vasur and friends in 1985, they made a big study, and they saw the patient gets the older, the degeneration, the relative changements in the ligaments is increasing as well. And of course, age-related stress strain, for example, uh, the frisbee dogs or uh, other type of, the, for example, agility dogs, they train and they compete all day of lives and the stress and the impact is uh, pre uh, collecting during those years and the crochet ligaments uh, is damaged during those years, and when they get older, for example, the one study showed that uh, agility dogs had over uh, over eight years old. They have uh, more likely will have the uh, stifle problems, and of course, age-related histological changements. It is uh, so common for them. Of course, uh, when we think that. Uh, the breed, the big and giant breeds that always have bigger chance to uh, have the cruciate ligament disease. Of course, the, the body weight. According to some, some studies, obesity increased the risk very high numbers. And body conformation. Some dogs have really st uh, stri uh, straight stifles. And those dogs so easily get hyperextension and it can cause to uh, ligament disease. Of course, in, uh, some studies show that sterilized and female uh, dogs have the higher risk, but in 1999, the Orland fans, uh, according to their study, higher uh, incidence in sterilized patients, but no significant difference between male and females. Uh, as I said, that we orthopedicians at the clinics, we uh, meet with those uh, patients daily basis, but if a uh, general practitioner uh, 
has not that much experience in orthopedics, so easily can uh, miss those cases. Most important thing is the clinic examination. With the clinic examination, you all, almost 90% then you can diagnose it, but not 100%, I'll come to that. And after that, we have to choose our radiologic ex examination. Is it enough to make a, just X-ray, or should we use more advanced uh, radiologic diagnostics, like MRI, CT, or ultrasound? We will come on that as well. But an arthroscopic examination is the, the golden standard of the uh, to the diagnose the crucial ligament diseases. Lameness. Lameness can can vary very wide. Some patients can have non-weight bearing, and some patients the short time lameness after rest, and the owner can easily say, oh, my dog is lame maybe two, three steps after uh, the rest, but then they don't see anything. Even that small information and the breed, how the body conformation of the dog, body weight and everything, then we easily, we can start thinking if there is any uh, stifle problems. Easily when you're talking with the patient owner, you can uh, look the, the patient, how is positioning and the sitting, and then it can give you some clue if there might be any problem in the stifle. If you see on the left side in the golden retriever, we call it as a square seating. And for to be able to sit in that position, we have to be in a nice flexion in the tarsal joint and full flexion in the stifle joints as well as the the hip joints. That means that dog looks to me really happy and healthy, uh, the joints. But if you look on the right side, you can see, try to sit on his left hind limb and try to open and widen the angle of the, the, the right stifle. That gives us uh, one uh, question mark that there might be any problem. Of course, most of the patients are chronic patients. If this is not a uh, traumatic case, then we suppose we are we supposed to see some muscle atrophy. And one of the most pathognomic clinical finding is the intraarticular muscle effusion. And if it's a chronic case, of course, we can easily palpate a medial buttress and the pain, especially in the extension where the cranial cruciate ligament is the most the stretched. So normally what I do, I always come behind from the, the patient with my two hands, I try to palpate both the muscles and see if I can get any uh, sense of differences on the muscle structures. And then I try to palpate the stifle joint from the behind. And if it's a healthy stifle, then you, you can palpate easily patellar tendon and on triangular uh, concave uh, places in medial and the lateral side of the uh, patellar tendon. That means that there is no effusion in the stifle joint. But if you can't find it, sometimes you have bilateral stifle uh, problem, then you cannot compare the problem, but then you, if you cannot feel those uh, concave uh, structures, medial or the, in the lateral side of the patellar tendon, then we also can easily start thinking that if there's any cushioned problem. 
One of the, uh, the most common palpatoric examination is the drawer sign. I will try to show you one video. And this is a whippet, which is not that common for the whippets, the, the cruciate ligament disease, but it was a, a racing dog and was eight years old and it fit for the, for the other studies that have been made and show that even athletic dogs, but in high uh, training sessions that might have cruciate ligament disease. Sir, we are not able to see the video. Okay. Because it's... Um, is it on right now? Can you see it right now? No, no, sir. Okay. Yeah, that's... Then I will, we can ex try to explain in here. Uh, the stifle joint, when you, when you put your the index finger and with your thumb, you hold the uh, distal femur and the patella and towards the tibia and the fabella and then you craniocaudal movement with this if it's a normal stifle is a healthy stifle cranial and the caudal cruciate ligament will be able to stabilize the joint so you are not be able to move in the young patients there's some laxity but it should be symmetric on the contralateral side so let's go back to the presentation. As we can. Uh, your, your presentation also stopped, sir. You should have to again start sharing. And again start sharing. I think you clip, uh, tap it on the stop sharing or something. I will. And of course, uh, I am sorry for the. It's okay. As I spoke, the, the resume presentation. Do you have the presentation yeah. right now? It is loading now, yes. Okay. Full Sorry screen. for the delay. I'm not uh, really good with the computers. Huh. That's why it might happen. <laughs> full screen, sir. Okay, okay. Now it has become full screen. Yeah. yeah. Video, video, we can see now, sir. You can see the video right now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, play. that's, yeah, now we can see what yes. I try to explain. You see the craniocaudal movement of the stifle. That showed that we had an extreme instability and uh, we will see afterwards some uh, arthroscopic videos that show that we have a total rupture of the craniocaudal ligament of this dog. That technique first uh, presented in 1978, Henderson Milton, and afterwards in the Slocum and the Divine, uh, also develop, and then we have right now another palpation technique uh, for the, to be able to diagnose the peculiar cruciate ligament disease, because we cannot say that if there is any, is the caudal or the cranial part. This only gives a hint if there is any instability. The other technique is the cranial tibial thrust technique. In this technique, hopefully you can see the video right now. Then we hold it with this, with deflection and extension of the uh, tubercle the joint we will have cranial shifting of the tibia then we are mostly 
almost diagnosed that there is a problem in the stifle joint, there is instability in the stifle joint, but we are not sure if there's a cranial or the caudal cushion ligament the problem. And then we would like to go further with some diagnostics. And the diagnostics, we almost all, uh, all the time we take the, the just the plain x-rays, but we shouldn't uh, forget that those x-rays are not to be able to see the cushion ligament. As we know, cushion ligament is a soft tissue and it won't be seen visible in the well, plain x-rays. But we try to see if there's any other secondary changements in the stifle joint, if there's any other problems, for example, any uh, neoplasia or something that can cause cushion problem uh, secondarily. And x-rays are really, really important to be able to perform the osteotomy techniques. That's why the, the, we have to include our uh, hook joint inside the uh, x-ray. And we always use a radio ball that we know the size then I can calibrate my X-ray and I can make my measurements and plan my, uh, plan my surgery. There are uh, many papers out how the, the differences and in this, uh, with A pictures we can see is a really mild symptoms or the, the radiological changements in the stifle joint but still we can see some radiopac area in the cranial portion of the stifle joint. If you look at the B, we have really mild osteophytes in the distal part of the patella and more obesity in the stifle. And at the C, we can see we have more fat pad sign and more osteophytes in the distal part of the uh, patella. As we see, there's one of our patients again. We have uh, the whole tibia to be able to measure how much TPA we have in here, and then we can plan if we're going to make the TPLO, CBLO, or TTA. But we can see there's a lot of uh, intraarticular effusion and some osteophytes in the distal part of the patella and the caudal part of the tibial plateau. Again, this also is a little bit more chronic patient that we have, we have more visible uh, liturgical findings in our X-ray. And this is also, as you can see, there's more osteophytes in the in the stifle joint. As we, as I said, arthroscopy is the golden standard of the, to be able to diagnose the cushion ligament disease. Because we have the possibility to fully inspect all the uh, intraarticular structures and it's a minimal invasive surgery, and uh, we can perform it, and right away, right after the arthroscopy, we can continue with our uh, operation technique. It can be uh, inter in the extracapsular or any uh, osteotomy techniques. Learning curve, it is not that steep, it is really played, but after you uh, have enough experience, then it won't take more than uh, 30 minutes. So it's a steal, it's a really easy and uh, reliable diagnostic technique and gives us the opportunity 
inspect the, the um, menisci and to be able to handle the menisc injuries during arthroscopy and then go further with the, uh, the, the surgery. Because the almost 40-45% uh, of the craniocruciate cruciate ligament, uh, the ruptured patients have the menisc problem. If we are not diagnosed, if we are not see if the menisci is intact and not has any damage, we cannot have the uh, the good results after the surgery. And here is a healthy stifle. And the behind the from now, I'm holding the caudal cruciate ligament. That was a little bit uh, damaged there, but it's normally it's really healthy, shine, and nice fibers. Here's the caudal part again. And now this is the cranial cruciate ligament. The fat spot is on the way as always. That's why it's difficult sometimes. And now we see the, the lateral menisci as we can see and should come the long digital yeah this was really short but it is intact as well again cranial cushion ligament called the lateral part big part and the cranial middle part is on the behind it's there Yeah, and then we have some stifle arthroscopies that shows easily that we can see. This is again the caudal uh, part, and we have to shave the, the fat bed and the inflammation to be able to visualize the cranial cruciate, but we can see the cruciate ligaments ruptured part is a partial rupture so i will just show it in here more after the yeah this is the the many sky on our the left but now it comes to the the medial and you can see this is the yeah this is the cranial cruciate ligaments parts that torn partially and during the surgery some surgeons try to remove all of the damaged cranial cruciate as a, for me i only remove if there is total rupture if it's a partial rupture i always try to leave it because we know that it will give us some help to be able to stabilize the partially. So that's why I always try to remove. And now we will see the medial menisci on that part again. Yeah. So, of course, some. Uh, Hospitals, some surgeons will do more advanced diagnostics before they do arthroscopy. An MRI can give good information, but if it's a, a small amount of a partial cranial cruciate ligament disease, it won't give you that uh, good information as you can get from the arthroscopy. And the cost of the MRI and the time for the patient has to go into the, uh, the MRI to be anesthetized. 
maybe one hour, one and a half hour, and after that, again, you have to do your arthroscopy to be able to say how big the uh, the damage in the crochet ligament and if there is any menisc damage. So that's why we normally don't do MRI for our patients. Ultrasound examination, that is an actually not to be able to see the cranial cushion damage. This is lately some uh, published articles on that to be able to diagnose the menisc injuries. So it is really difficult. You need the uh, expert uh, diagnostics, uh, has to do the ultrasound for the medial menisci. But if you don't do around 50 stifles per week, then uh, this is really difficult to get used to and find the, uh, the many sky problem. Because we are talking about really small bucket handle, uh, the tears, it's almost like one, two millimeters in length. And in white, it's not so displaced, then that makes uh, it really difficult to diagnose. Yeah, when we come to the, the treatment, of course, Concentrated treatment is always an option. We cannot say is a good option, but in some countries, the operation costs are really high and there is no insurance for the animals. And that leave the patient owner in a really difficult situation that they had to choose conservative treatment or sometimes we have really bad conditioned patients geriatric patients as multiple uh, other problems for example heart diseases and different problems that gives us no chance to go further with the anesthesia and any osteotomy or the extracapsular technique then those patients has to go further with conservative treatments. But we shouldn't forget that if untreated cases, unavoidable of the degenerative joint disease and the secondary menisc damage, because we cannot stabilize the stifle joint without any surgery. That means that we have constant movement in the stifle joint and uh, it's moving on the medial menisci that gives us a um, secondary menis uh, this uh, problem in the future. And as we say that, we, unfortunately, stifle joint, we cannot stabilize it with only rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, if we strengthen all the structure around the stifle, we can help, we can gain some instability, but for a full uh, instability, unfortunately, we cannot do that. And it gives the, the patient the lameness rest of the life. And after a couple of years, at the end, most of those patients has to be euthanized. Yeah, let's come to some surgical uh, different treatments. There is two different, three different ways. One is the primary repair. And it is only, if we are aiming to the primary repair, is only in evolution, the, the fractures we call it, because it, and those only occurs in the uh, skeletally immature patients and those the trauma is the, it always occurs with the trauma and the strength of the the ligament is higher than the attachment of the ligament and then it's pulled from the 
uh, from the its insertion or the origin. And then we have the possibility, according to how big the piece, then we can put some the K wire and tension bend. Or if we have a bigger piece, then even we can put a uh, leg screw. And it, actually, still, I would I would like to I would just want to say is that all some old techniques, but still. Uh, some surgeons are uh, using this, and the human field I know they're still using an intraarticular reconstruction techniques. Those are aimed to use his own uh, body fascias and the tendons to and go into the joint and try to uh, replace it in the same anatomic places as. Uh, Kernicushet ligament disease, but we know that there's a lot of complication afterwards from those techniques, and uh, the results are not as good as uh, other osteotomy techniques. And there are some other uh, operation techniques, of course, like extracapsular techniques, the tightrope lateral fibular fibular head transposition. Those techniques are so common, especially the dogs weight less than 15 kilos. I have made some uh, researches of that and I will show the results in the future in the presentation. Those techniques are more common than the osteotomy techniques because it's doesn't take that much time. The cost of the implant is not that high. That's why it is so uh, easily uh, practiced in all the, uh, the, the clinics or the hospitals. But this is really impossible to made a 100% good stability. If we are going to um, choose extra capsular technique, one of those, then we have to know the isometry. Isometry, it's, I'll try to explain. If we want to put an, uh, an the material with the transarticular place, then we want that that material would be in the same tension in both in fully extension and fully flexion. And this is almost impossible to standardize an operation technique because our patients does not have the same anatomy. If you think uh, an Dachshund tibia, uh, shape and if you think an uh, border collie tibia, it's totally different. And if you standardize that the isometric the the points, that means that in extension or deflection, it won't give us the the same results. And there are some other papers out there. And Fisher uh, in two thousand ten uh, tried a different. Uh, isometric places and see the flexion of uh, the different the stifle angle uh, strength in the those materials and we see we cannot get the same tension in the in the material and of course there is as I said that here is that individual anatomy makes finding of isometric points difficult in small animal uh to breed dogs that's the white in 2015 so that this is really difficult and almost impossible and the material there is not a, such a material that has still we has the strength and flexibility if we choose really strength the stiff material then we don't have the Flexibility. 
But if we choose, if we go for the flexibility, then we don't have the strength. And that's why extra capsular techniques, we know if we, now the fiber wire is the one of the most common uh, material, but it has around 10,000 steps length and at the end we know that it will break and then again we will have uh, an instability and we might need another surgery to be able to and consensus in 2005 the uh, the meta research as we can see of the results then on the left bar we can see is the, the healthy dogs and the second bar is the TPLO patients with 18 weeks after the surgery almost uh, reached this healthy uh, weight burning on the operated leg with extra capsular is better than the conservative part uh, the patients but still it's not as good as an osteotomy technique. Again, we in uh, the Nelson in 2013 compare on the gate analyze uh, with the TPLO and extracapsular technique. As we can see, extra caps uh, extracapsular technique is not be able to reach the the normal weight bearing on the operated leg. And osteotomy techniques. There are several osteotomy techniques, and those techniques are based for not to uh, stabilize the joint with the help, or uh, they we, we aim to change the tibial plateau angle and neutralize the stability, and then we will not need the, the help of the, from the cruciate ligament to be able to stabilize uh, the stifle joint. There are different techniques, some of them more difficult than the, the, the usual techniques we use, uh, but all try to, uh, or most of them, because there's a, we have TTA and it's a totally different uh, technique to stabilize the stifle joint. Cranial wedge osteotomy, Slocum in 1984, just come up with the idea if they made an osteotomy in the cranial portion of the tibia and made a closing wedge uh, osteotomy and then they increase, they decrease the tibial uh, plateau angle and stabilize it with a plate and it gives us uh, as a almost like a two three degree tibial plateau angle and neutralize the tibial kind of caudal uh, movement in the stifle joint. Another technique, uh, Timur Dommel in 2003 uh, from Switzerland made a proximal tibial osteotomy and it is really difficult to, to proceed the surgery but it's also it's an, an osteotomy, it's a, it's a closing wedge to be able to uh, change the tibial plateau angle. And triple tibial osteotomy, De Bruce uh, in 2007 come up with an idea if they made, if you can see in the, uh, the, the, the picture, and three osteotomies at the end, you have a, a place that you remove the, the uh, one osteotomy size, and if you close all the osteotomies together, then you have lesser tibial plateau angle. But again, it is really difficult to uh, measure and to make the, all those small osteotomies. That's um, most of all likely, it's, that's why it's not usable that much. Another technique, the circular tibial tuberosity advancement. This is not planning to aim the change the tibial plateau angle. This is 
more like uh, more uh, close to the tibial tibia advancement technique then is move the, the patellar tendon more cranially and then it's try to stabilize the the stifle with the tibial thrust and tibial tuberosity advancement as one of the most common osteotomy techniques and this has many advantages and some disadvantages as well and with the newer plates it make uh, osteotomy and the surgery much more easy and safe I will explain why, why, why the new implants. As you can see, in the right side, there's a old implant. Then the osteotomy goes really distal, and the fractures of the cranial portion, or sometimes in the, in the caudal portion of the tibia, is was so common. But with the new uh, implants, it gives us shorter. Uh, osteotomy option and the fractures can also occur but is much more uh, safer procedure and our clinic our colleagues Barbara Dial and Hugo Schumacher in 2017 made a uh, research with the 48 cases with TTA rapids and with the owner uh, questionnaire it was a uh, was excellent uh, most of the case and cases we have only uh, three fair and one poor uh, result after the surgery as we can see that the most of the owners were really uh, satisfied with the surgery even after 72 weeks after the surgery as I said, the, 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 uh, the new sets, we have be able to make the shorter osteotomies and the other uh, option with the TTA, rapid systems, where we can perform medial patellar luxa uh, luxation treatment in the same operation. As you can see on the left side, the small washers, and with those help, we can put under the our uh, the cage, and then we can lateralize the tibial tuberosity. And the implants are nowadays it's really small, and even we can operate uh, smaller than three kilo the patients. Yeah, that we have to talk about that, and it gives us the the, the new the Rita Leibinger come with the idea that uh, if we have a severe instability, then we need not only try to st try to stabilize with the cage, but we put an extra capsular uh, technique as well to be able to get rid of the uh, pivot shifting. But uh, Peter Butcher and the friends made a really interesting and difficult study. And in that study, in vivo fluoroscopic uh, kinematography of the uh, cronicodal stifle instability after tubular tuberosity advancement, and it showed that after the TTA, 70% of the stifles are not uh, still stable. But those patients, the clinically were fine and the owner were happy. But when they come on the fluoroscopy, that we see that the stifle still has an uh, instability. And in the future, it will give us degenerative joint disease and the pain and the secondary meniscus uh, problems. 
as you can see in here, and each time when the iron limb is on the ground, femur goes caudally, and here. I can show again, it's not easy to see. Yes, goes caudally, and here. So it's then easier or is it a faster technique? We can easily uh, proceed in other like, everywhere in the clinics. Doesn't need any circular osteotomes and things, but the result that we have, we might have still some instability inside in stifle joint. Some surgeons try to put bigger cages than they uh, the measure. But at the end, still, we have uh, an instability in the stifle joint. And yes, there's a, one of the most uh, common osteotomy technique is the tibial plateau leveling osteotomy technique. This is uh, right now accepted as a golden standard for the treated cruciate ligament the patients and I will try to show a video that's why I have to pause the presentation and open a video right now Can you see the video? No, sir, no. It is coming. Play, play it, sir. Okay. As we can see in here, the yes, stifle yes. joint. The cranial and the caudal cruciate ligaments the femur and uh, in the meniscus the caudal part and the cranial part and it stabilizes the stifle joint in the curly caudal motion but with the if you see there, there's some damage when we have total rapture, we have excessive uh, instability. And with that, then we measure our tibial plateau angle and made a an circular osteotomy. And after we see our in charge, how much our to the tibia plateau angle and what which uh, which size of the blade we use then it gives us a and how much rotation we will uh, use and after we give that rotation and then we put a the plate to stabilize that rotation And now we neutralize the stability in the stifle joint. Yes, now I will go back to the presentation again. I'll to stop this and no. Can you see the presentation right now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sorry for the, the delay. As we can see in those uh, the x-rays on the left side, we see as a pre-op x-ray, we have the radio ball and the x-ray that we don't, it gives it a possibility uh, 
to measure the the, the landmarks and we put our circular uh, osteotomy where we want and then from the traverse's tibia uh, and other landmarks we made uh, our measurements with those help we can uh, find our osteotomy lines we mark it we made the osteotomy and after we call look at their chart we made our rotation and put the the plate and uh, Nelson uh, in 2013 made a really good research on the force plate and it shows us in after the really the, sh the short part of the time, uh, after 50 to 100 days we gain our uh, the, the operated legs uh, on usement and after one year we almost have the normal uh, vertical uh, peak pressure on the force, force plate. And of course with the new plates we have possibility put an extra capsular uh, the operation technique with the TPLO and it gives us to be able to handle with the pivot shifting chip as well. And the other technique which is uh, newer than the TPLO technique in 2013 uh, Donald House come up with an idea to make an osteotomy change the tibial plateau angle but in the uh, center of rotation that gives us the weight bearing if you think in the tplo here the weight bearing part is the most uh, the caudal portion of the tibia but with this tblo technique with the core based uh, center of rotation based osteotomy gives us the possibility to bear weight bearing in all all tibia I will again switch it to other video. Is it? Can you see it? Yes, I yes, <clears throat> we can. Yes. Yes, again, after the arthroscopic examination, we made our approach on the medial side and we already have the measurements and we made a circular cut in this direction, as you can see right now. And then we measure our uh, the rotation and made marks. And when we get together those two marks after the fully osteotomy, then we reach ten degree of total uh, the post op uh, tibial plateau angle. And Donald House used the technique that put the first uh, uh, transcondylar uh, transcortex screws into the uh, to be able to stabilize the osteotomy and then achieve compression with those and then put the plate. But in our clinic, we use firstly the the plate made the compression and then uh, the screws placed to be able to strengthen the uh, cranial portion of the osteotomy because we shouldn't forget 
the patellar tendon attached on the cranial portion and with the heavy dog has a lifting uh, strength is really high and if you don't put uh, big enough screw or sometimes we put uh, an, a plate on the cranial portion then you might see an lifting and it give you a uh, bad outcome after the surgery and we put the faster yeah we put the locking screw on the cranial the proximal portion of the plate and then we tighten the cortical screws to be able to get compression as well in some places some plate uh, techniques and the lockings as well yes we go again back to the presentation again how we measure where the with the center of rotation point and put our uh, osteotomy circle there made our uh, calculations with the landmarks and then it's a post-op uh, x-ray how it look like with a uh, with our plate it's also it's uh, when with this technique we can be able to make an uh, double osteotomy for the excessive tibial plateau angle if you see with this uh, patient we have more than 40 degrees of tibial plateau angle and with it if you know the charts in the tplo and cblo we don't have those uh, higher angles in the charts that's why we plan to make a double osteotomy it's like almost a uh, closing wedge and we get rid of the 10 percent of the the tibial plateau angle and then we reach the, the lesser numbers and then we continue the uh, procedure according to the on the tables yeah on that patient we remove that part and at the end we reach 10 degrees after the operations this is uh one of my studies between 2018 and 19 we made uh, cblo lesser than 15 kilo patients and we didn't reach any complications and on the the pressure since the walkway results in the CBLO patients almost reach and the contralateral healthy uh, the contralateral side and finally we come on the last part the rehabilitation is as important as your operation or the surgery technique because if we have a possibility to make a rehabilitation we can increase uh, we can we can remove the the pain in the from the stifle joint as the, the fast enough and then with our pain, our dogs can use the hind limbs faster and better and we can gain the muscle as a back and we uh, this is important for the uh, canine sports medicine that our patient has to come back to their work sport as soon as possible and almost in the better condition and the rehabilitation starts right after the surgery there are some different techniques for cold and compression 
treatment if the the facility has the opportunity to buy a uh, expensive unit of course those units are works fabulous when you put those the the bandages for 20 minutes and it uh, gives cold and compression and it's as a pain relief and uh it's this stifle knees is not swollen after the treatment but if you not be able to buy those expensive units then just some ice bags 20 minutes and after that you can remove it and you will almost gain uh, the same results but you will see the big difference if you use any cold compression after the stifle surgeries or not then you see the day after the patients that uh, you had the cold compression most likely will use leg better than the other ones and right after the surgery if you perform the surgery in the in the morning and right after afternoon we start with passive rate of motion on those patients still on opioids and not be able to uh, walk properly that's why we have to help them our physiotherapists go to the cages and short uh, sessions at least one or two times in the same day just some extension and flexion and joint mops that gives them pain relief and much more uh, easy to, to use the, the leg the day after and for the pain relief you can use electrotherapy and it gives a uh, better chance to not uh, use that much opioids and uh, you can just some two three opioids injections and then even you can further with uh, electrotherapy and some uh, people use acupuncture instead of electrotherapy but this acupuncture is also really useful for the get off rid of the pain increase the it increase the uh, effusion from the stifle joint and after uh, our surgery just two weeks we always do at home and passive range of motion they can come to our hospital and do with our physiotherapist one two times and after that under those under the under those uh, sessions we teach the owners how they perform for the uh, passive range of, mo of motion the trainings and then they perform at home at least five six times per day and after we remove the stitches after two weeks then we start some isometric trainings also isometric trainings means that we train the muscles and the ligaments by only standing and the, with the body weight if it's uh, the dog is doing good we have we need more strength trainings then we can use some balance pads or even you can use some books to hire the the front part and then we, the weight point shifts on the the back part of the the animal and gives you more weight bearing on the hind limbs and then you change your isometric trainings and with those balance pads owners easily can do more than 20 different trainings and the first after two weeks two to four weeks we uh, train our patients with isometric trainings and after four weeks we do our normal routine check we made our x-rays to see if everything is fine our plates and the screws 
doing good with an ice bone healing and if the patient is using the leg better and better and then we go further with the harder trainings to gain uh, strength and build some muscles the underwater trade miles are really useful that we control the level of the water and it gives the uh, change the uh, strength of the training and sometimes if we some clinics doesn't not have the possibility have the underwater treadmill and then they use the treadmill and in this part they know how fast how long can dog can train because sometimes it's difficult when you go outside and walk the dog you have different distractions around the uh, in the house and different landscapes that's why for the just uh, the training we use uh, land treatment and short walks and the house and if we if uh, the, the facility has a possibility have a swimming pool like this. This is one picture from our rehab center, and then it's a full body. But this is the the last part of the rehabilitation, and now we can try all of the body. And with the help of the window, we can see how good the legs are uh, using during the during the uh, training, and of course. Those are if the facility has those options. But otherwise, as I said, with the small the balance pads, you can train 20, 30 different trainings. When you your, your patient is good, good enough, then we can just go on a hill and sit and stand on a hill, try to go in zigzags. And even if your facility does not have those uh, instrument still rehabilitation is possible and it gives you faster healing of the the uh, fracture of course also because we know that the rehabilitation has uh, the good effects on the fracture healing if it's made in a right way of course and we can gain the muscle uh, the back and the faster and then the patient will use the leg better and sooner and if you have a training or a working or a training dog then can come back to work or uh, sport faster and thank to Siebert and Hugo Schumacher for those the, the pictures and some of the, the videos. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Hope it's not that boring. And Thank sorry you. for the for the, the Oh, videos sorry. that I have to change and we have some delays between. Yeah, yeah the videos are very uh, interesting, sir. Both are very good. We are enjoying that. The webinar was very nice. We have some questions for you, sir. We need to discuss. Yeah. yeah. Some of uh, our audience have asked little questions, like one of which is, what are the percentage of rupture of cranial cruciate ligament compared to the caudal cruciate ligament? Uh, there are some papers out with that we know that if we have a uh, stifle instability, the 80 to 88 percent uh, is the, the cranial cushion ruptures. Yes. Of course, there are different papers shows that this is 60 to 95. There's different uh, the percentage but if we made a total sum is around the 885 is the the most of the the, the cranial cushion ligament okay sir. another question 
Is there any specified supplements that you in your clinics used to give before operation or after operation that it will uh, helps for the rehabilitation and for more some uh, some other you if you have any suggestions yeah uh, at our hospital our we we are uh, the referral centers and all the patients are referred from uh, the first uh, opinion vets and those patients already on uh, some non, um, non steroid anti inflammatory medications. And after we examine the patients, we keep using steroid um, uh, anesthetics even during after the surgery, approximately four or five weeks after the surgery. We are not using any other uh, the supplements, just uh, some non steroid anti inflammatory medication and glucosamine condiosulfates. We know that glucosamine condiosulfates, in the hum even in the human fields, there is not so big uh, public uh, the publications that it, it works. Mostly in human fields, it's placebo effect, but we know omega-3 omega is really good to regenerate the, the, the cartilage and yes. because I mean condensed fats and omega three is was also uh, we prescribe. Yes, sir. Omega three fats, fatty acids. Thank you. Then uh, another question is: uh, if most of the cases, sir, uh, the these uh, some of the clinics they can't able to identify whether it is a cranial uh, ligament rupture or not. In many cases, we most of the case they went unnoticed. What are the main complications or what are the worst things that may happen if the animal got unnoticed? Uh, like uh, maybe it is a, oh, maybe some uh, lameness is there like that only. And you, uh, doctors used to prescribe only the uh, calcium supplements or something else, uh, vitamin supplements and leave it as it is. What are the main complications that usually occurs? Yeah, as I said, this is not so easy to miss if there is a really small amount of the the, the ligament is uh, affected. We are only some effusion and really little part of the, the amount of lameness. So easy to uh, miss those cases. Or we only go for the, some pain medication and two, three weeks rest and keep uh, doing the normal life at the result if it's a partial then it will be a total rupture if it's a total rupture then it will develop degenerative joint disease really in early uh, days and at the end we will have severe lameness and a lot of osteophytes in the, in the stifle joint that even and good osteotomy technique cannot give uh, as good result as if we made it on the on the day first, day one. And of course, if we have, if we remember the the study that untreated stifles cannot reach good weight bearing as operated or in healthy uh, leg. Yes, yes, yes. Of course. <clears throat> it's uh, another question which which are the which among the three these uh, surgical techniques which among these you prefer mostly the one is tibial plateau leveling osteotomy cranial closing wedge osteotomy tibial tuberosity advancement which one you prefer more um normally I, I i use uh, the uh, tplo as my the 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 first choice of treatment, but in the last two years, we try to do more core-based leveling osteotomy because it is more based on the center of rotation, but we have some uh, complication possibilities in the CBLOs, as I told, if it's a heavy patient or really strong patient like arm staffs and things, they have really enormous strength to the patellar tendon 
and if we put only on two screws in the cranial portion then we might see an lift off and it gives us the uh, as, as, as not as good as a uh, good uh, tibia plata angle or we can have some fractures in the proximal part of the screws that's why we have to choose our patients and if there is a old patient an owner does not have the economical possibilities to we can perform an tpl or cblo but we know we have to do something to stabilize that stifle and those patients operation take the time is really short and uh, the prices is, is, is lesser and some some patients that we have to choose an extra capsular so that's why if it's a normal healthy active dog i go for with the tplo but if there is any anatomical problems for example if it's a dash wound or there's a not no normal tibia shape then i prefer to use cblo and if there's another uh, things that i have to be you have to, have to consider for example age the price and everything that even we can go further with with extra capsular so this is really difficult you have to uh, understand the patient you have to know all those techniques and see possibilities that owners can give and then made a nice uh, combination for your treatment yes sir, sir thank you thank you these are the questions sir thank you for your time um, um, and, and thank you again yes. for giving me the opportunity to to meet with all uh, our colleagues around the, the world and thank you so much thank you sir i would like to extend my thank to our uh, uh, it department for providing us all the necessary help and our uh, management and lastly i would also love to thank all our speakers who has volunteered their time with us for sharing the knowledge and uh, for our audience please keep uh, uh, visiting ours because in coming days also we are going to have some uh, other uh, speakers uh, stay happy stay healthy stay have a safe day sir thank you sir thank you so much so now i can please uh, thank you so much, Dr. Abishkek, and let me know if you need other uh, presentations in the orthopedic fields. I can help, or I can uh, help you to find other um, yes, speakers. Yes, sir. Sure, 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 sir. I will. Thank you for your Perfect. time. Have a nice day. See you, sir.